The Black Doctors Podcast highlights the stories of minority professionals with the goal of inspiring others. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and share with others because the next generation can't be what they don't see. Tune in every Monday to hear our stories told by us. Hello and welcome back to the Black Doctors Podcast. Today I'm privileged to be speaking with Dr. Jasmine Branchcomb. She's one of my classmates from Howard University College of Medicine, class of 2014. She is currently a radiologist practicing in California. Dr. Branchcomb, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Dr. Bradley. So why don't you start by telling us what life is like as a radiologist? What's your day-to-day life? So I am a private practice radiologist, so my experience will be slightly different from a academic radiologist or a teleradiologist. But I go to work Monday through Friday, generally, eight to five. Um, Depending on the day, I do procedures, whether it be a thyroid FNA, it can be fluoroscopy, breast biopsies, um, body biopsies sometimes. It just depends on the site that I'm at and diagnostic studies, obviously. And then it gets further broken down into, am I working at an outpatient clinic or am I working in the hospital? Hospital workflow is a little bit different. You're managing the ER and inpatient studies. And so you walk into a list of studies every day and you just try and get through that list. It's never ending. Um, (laughs) There are minimal breaks. (laughs) There are interruptions from texts, from clinicians, um, patients even. So it's a constant just juggle of getting through studies and also managing talking to your colleagues. Um, So every day is not just sitting in a dark room. I know that's Yeah, that was my next question. (laughs) No, no, no. Um, There are plenty of days where I have face-to-face interaction with patients through various procedures that we do. So how does it look on the back end? So if a physician places an order for a biopsy, Mm -hmm. how does that patient get to you? So a physician places an order for a biopsy. It comes to the radiology department. One of the front office staff will bring it back to the radiologist because we have to vet everyone. So I get the procedure request. I look in the patient chart. I look up their imaging, see what it is they're requesting to be biopsied. It could be an inguinal lymph node. So I look at the imaging. Is the lymph node large enough? Is there a better, you know, is it accessible percutaneously? What's the best imaging modality that I can use to get to that lymph node, whether it be ultrasound or CT? Is there a better lymph node that could be biopsied? Is there something that looks more suspicious? Then it's taking into account of what the patient's history is. You know, are they on any anticoagulation or mm. blood thinner that may preclude them getting a lymph node biopsy, you know, immediately, or maybe they have to stop some medication prior. If it's not a lymph node, you know, if, you're, if we're being asked to biopsy a mass, like, well, what do we think this mass is? Is this something that could potentially seed the biopsy tract? Because then we need to work in conjunction with orthopedic surgery or whoever is going to be managing the patient surgically to decide the best approach. Because if it's something that could see the tract, we may need to biopsy it in a particular way so that when the surgeon goes in to do excision, they're taking the tract out and it's not going to seed somewhere else. Once we decide that something is biopsyable uh, via imaging, then we'll, you know, we'll put them on the schedule, send the instructions to the patient, stop your anticoagulation, don't eat, whatever the instructions may be, depending on if they're getting local anesthesia or if they're getting moderate sedation. And then the patient comes in, we biopsy, and then they go back to their doctor for the results. Huh. Those are some really good questions. God dang. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a lot more that goes into it. I wish it could be that, hey, you know, whenever we get a request for a biopsy, absolutely we'll do it. But there's just so much more that goes into it. And, you know, it it sounds like, oh, you just go to radiology and things magically happen. But we we have to consider some of the same things that surgeons have to consider. You know, is this patient at risk for, you know, an adverse event by going under moderate sedation? Can they have sedation? You know, what's the best approach to get this? So it's a little bit more involved, but it's fun. It's nice. It's a nice, short, 
patient contact, which I think most radiologists appreciate. You still have it, but it's not so um, drawn out that we have to see the patient, you know, every month or every other week. It's like a nice, concise meeting. Nice. Is, is the INR the first or second thing you check? Oh, that's first. <laughs> 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 that is first. <laughs> what is that INR? <laughs> because that will, <laughs> that's a red light, <laughs> you know. If oh, we know. If it's too high. <laughs> we know. Awesome. So, so I know with, uh, you mentioned academic and teleradiology. Could you speak uh, about those fields? Sure. So the, like I said before, there, there's three main fields, academic, teleradiology, and private practice. So teleradiology is what everyone or a lot of people have in their mind when they think of radiologists. They're sitting at home in their pajamas. They're off somewhere, remote reading studies. So these people work for private equity companies, and some people may know them like Envision Physician Services because they're a multi-specialty um, private equity group who employs other physicians as well. So mm-hmm. I'll use them as my example. But say you can work for Envi- Envision Physician Services. They will provide a home workstation for you, meaning the CPU and sometimes monitors. They'll provide a desk, you know, dictaphone, all of the software that you need. And you work from home. You sign on to their system and you read studies for multiple hospitals and it could be multiple states. So that does require that you be licensed in those states to read for those hospitals. But there are radiologists out there who are licensed in almost every single state in the United States and they read for multiple hospitals. Um, And so that offers you more flexibility in terms of your work hours, your work days, and how much money you make. Because there are certain models out there where you get paid for each study that you read versus you being employed, an employed physician where you receive a salary. So even within the teleradiology world, there's different payment structures. So you get that flexibility. Then with academic radiologists, those are the radiologists that you encounter during training. They're mainly at academic institutions. And depending on how your academic institution is set up, you might um, rotate through some community hospitals. And so those radiologists are usually practicing in their subspecialty, in their area of subspecialty training. They do one thing, essentially, one or two things. So you'll have a neuroradiologist or you'll have a body radiologist or an MSK radiologist. And in addition to doing radiology, part of their job is instructing trainees. So they work with residents, fellows, medical students. They're doing research. Um, so this is the radiologist that you encounter mostly during your training. And then there's a private practice radiologist. So this radiologist is out in the community. They're working for um, private practices, which are sometimes radiologists owned. So you might have a group of five or six radiologists who contract with a, a community hospital and they provide the radiologist services for that hospital. Hmm. Um, or you can work for a larger health system like I do, um, such as I guess in the Bay Area, so Kaiser. Kaiser is nationally known. So you can work for Kaiser as a private practice radiologist, which is a large health system, and provide services for them. Or you can, excuse me, you can do a combination of both private practice and academic or private practice and teleradiology. Uh, There's all kinds of variations that you can choose, but private practice does offer uh, a larger salary because you have a few people working really hard to read a ton of studies, you know, generating a larger amount of income, which gets split between you guys. So those are the options following training. I think they're very good options in terms of a work-life balance, which is one thing that I love about radiology. I know that's right. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. So... Dr. Branscombe, why don't you tell us about your pathway to medicine? When did you decide to become a physician? Oh, man. So 
I wanted to be an engineer at first. And I know a lot of people say this and I don't know why that is, but we all want to be engineers first. And then for some reason we say, forget that and choose medicine. So I did a summer program in 10th grade um, for STEM. Um, yeah, what was it? Cosmos at UC Irvine. And I went there for robotics engineering. And once I got hit with all of that calculus and <laughs> physics, <laughs> I was like, this ain't it. <laughs> but there were other people who were, who had decided they were interested in medicine. And so I would just hang out with them and watch them do their coursework. And I was like, oh, okay. Like something I'm actually interested in, human biology, anatomy, and physiology. I was like, oh, I, I can probably get with that. And then I learned how much doctors make, not that it's a lot of money, but that it is a lifestyle where you don't have to necessarily worry about your bills or money. It provides a comfortable lifestyle, and it's something that can't really be taken away from you. No one can take that skill away from you. And so I was like, you know, that, that seems like a viable career. Um, and so from then I just kind of focused on doing well in my science courses. And that's when I decided to find a college that would really put me in a position to get into medical school. And that's how I ended up finding Xavier. I, now, I always knew I wanted to go to a HBCU. I had never planned to stay in California for college. Yeah. But once I figured out that Xavier was like the, the, um, the best place to go if you want to go to med school and be black, I was like, oh. And I visited yeah, sign it. me up. Yeah, sign me up. <laughs> you know, it felt like home. Because com- coming from California, I, I was always the minority. There was always two or three black people in my class. And because I was in AP classes and honors classes, well, then that got even lower. You know, I was one of two or the only. So for me, going to a black school, that was number one. And it felt like home when I visited the school. And so it was a done deal from there. And that was one of the best decisions I ever made. So as Xavier, you were there during um, Hurricane Katrina, right? Yeah. So how was that? Hurricane Katrina happened the beginning of my junior year. So freshman year, sophomore year, best time of my life. And then a couple weeks into junior year, I was on a retreat for some leadership thing that I was doing. And we got sent back home because they're like, oh, a hurricane is coming. And we're all, you know, we've all been through hurricanes. This is year three. It usually goes like, oh, a hurricane is coming. You pack a bag, you go somewhere for two or three days, and then you come back to school. It's like a nice little vacation. So we all thought that was what was going to happen. So, and this time, because we had been through hurricanes, my roommate and I, we were like, well, we're not going to go anywhere this time because (laughs) there's no, you know, it's it's just going to be a little, you know, it's going to turn. And then we're going to be back, and neither of us had a car, so we're like, we're, we'll just stay here on this one. But then as the days started going by, and it's like the hurricane's not turning, now they're forcing everybody to evacuate, where usually it's just a voluntary evacuation. Then This is the first time it turned into like a mandatory evacuation. So we had to scramble and find uh, a way out of the city. And thank God, one of our friends was going to Houston. And so we were able to get a ride with him the night before, like, all hell broke loose. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Look look at God. Look at God, because if we had stayed, oh, man, I don't even know. You'd have been at the Superdome. I don't know, man. <laughs> I I don't know. But uh, we drove all night and made it to Houston. And when we woke up in the morning, we saw that the city was flooded. We were like, I just knew then, like, oh, shit, we're there's no way we're going to be go back, going to be able to go back to school. And so that was devastating because it's like you're it's junior year of college. You're getting ready to take the MCAT to apply to med school. And all of that just goes out the window because now you don't have a school to go back to. You don't know when that's going to happen, if ever, because you don't know how bad it's going to be. And so where we were staying, I knew 
we both knew like we don't want to be here and we're not trying to stay in Houston. So we both we never went back to New Orleans. We just got flights back home to the Bay Area and we stayed at our parents' house for like a few days. And then I started looking for other places to go to school because I'm like, there's no way Xavier's opening back up as the days go by. You see like now you're hearing, oh, the levee's breaking. Oh, more flooding. It's just like, well, hell, we're never going to get back. And so I got us enrolled at the University of San Francisco, um, and they allowed us to continue our semester there. Thank God, you know, wow. tuition free. They provided us room and board, um, and they were very kind, and we were able to continue our classes. So wow. we went to the University of San Francisco for a semester. And once Xavier opened back up, they opened, this was 2005, so they opened January of 2006. I went back. None of my friends went back. They were like, nah, I'm going to stay here at USF. I'm going to finish. I'm not going back there. And so that was really hard to yeah. have my entire friend group just not be there anymore on top of going back to a city that is not really open, not really functioning as a city. You know, there's no grocery stores open around Xavier. There's, <clears throat> you know, people, the homes are still boarded up. Yeah. You know, you still see everything. Noth there's no infrastructure. So Xavier is just like, oh, we're open, come back. But we have no way to to take care of you or for you guys to take care of yourself. So that was, it was really hard and it was an adjustment period for me. And I did very poorly that semester. But once I got those midterm grades and I saw <laughs> some C's and D's, I was like, oh no, <laughs> oh no. I said, I cannot go, I can't get into med school with a C and a D. And oh, something just flipped in me and I got my stuff together. And by the end of that semester, I was back on track with my A's and B's, but That's right. it was, it was hard. It was, and you know, trying to make new friends. It was just, it was the craziest thing I've ever been through, but I still love Xavier despite all of the drama that I went through. They still had our backs in terms of preparing us for medical school applications and interviews, and they will always get credit for that. And I will always, always recommend any Black student who wants to go to med school to really, really consider Xavier because there's yeah. no other place like it. Wow. So you went from Xavier to Howard. So you're interviewing for medical schools. Uh, why did you choose Howard? Because it felt like home. Again, <laughs> when I went for the interview, you know, you, <laughs> I've already had the experience of being a Xavier. So now I know what it feels like to be around other Black students who have similar goals who have similar aspirations. And when I went to Howard and I was like, oh, oh, all the attendings are black. You know, 90% of the med students are black. You just around so many black students who are doing well and aspiring to be something great. It's very hard to go to a PWI and feel that same energy and that same love. Yeah. Once I got my acceptance at Howard, I was like, well, that's it, I'm going. I I didn't interview anymore, and I, you know, let the other schools know, like, I'm not coming. Then you arrived at Howard, and you met small group three. I tell the folks, <laughs> small group three. Then we got it, small group three. Yeah, y'all were something else, but it, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> small group three, like, y'all made the experience. You know, it was so, we had so much fun, so yeah. much fun. And I still tell people to this day, like, I had so much fun in med school, so much so that I'm like, would I go back and do it again? And I sometimes <laughs> consider, yeah, because y'all were the best. You take away step one and two and <laughs> residency applications. Mm, I mean, I just feel like the the experience that we had and the fun we had kind of outweighs that, at least in my mind. Like, I didn't feel like it was that traumatic. Yeah, no, I, it was the best time ever. Yeah, small group three, because that was, they just kind of started transitioning into those group learning things. And I remember us, our little group of 10 scared medical students, and we all got in a little room together and just became a family pretty much uh, over the next four years. Yeah, that's, 
essentially what happened. And we absorbed some people from another group. I don't remember yes, which one. We did. <laughs> a bunch of groups, you know, that, but that was Howard, right? Yeah. And so, you know, Howard was such a great experience. And I think it was very important to have those black attendings. I know people mm-hmm. don't like to say that, but that was the most important thing for me. I don't know if I would have been in radiology had I not had Dr. Davis to look up yeah. to. Had I not seen or interacted with Dr. Davis, I probably wouldn't have been in radiology. You were on the fence from what I recall. Yes, Stephen, on the fence. Because I was just like, you know, there's no way I'm going to get into radiology. I don't know how high I'm going to score on step one. And even when I got my step one score, I was just like, ooh, I don't know if it's high enough. But Dr. Davis, she's the one who encouraged me. And we made it happen. I know that's right. We were both, man... Application season that that was rough doing these interviews and but you know we we did all right Jasmine we did we made it so so how was that because you went to oh, where'd you go to residency for radiology I went to LAC USC Medical Center some people call it USC but it's really LAC USC because you are employed by LA County and that's where you do most of your rotations um, and that was. Even that was a great experience. I'm very happy that I matched there for residency and so much that I stayed there for fellowship. Yeah. How how was that transition? Um, I think it was, in terms of socially, it was very different because of the friendships that I made at Howard and how easy it was to connect with people because obviously we have our Blackness in common. So it's just it's just something a little bit easier about connecting with other black students that it just happened faster at Howard. But at USC, now you're bringing people from across the country and sometimes even out of the country and you're dropping them in this high, um, you know, this intense environment. And so it's more like trauma bonding, like you find someone <laughs> and <laughs> because you're both going through something so horrible. <laughs> and then sometimes it's like, oh yeah, I really like this person. And I that's what happened with me. Like I really love my best friend from residency. But otherwise, it's like some people I'm just not, you know, I'm not cool with. I don't care to talk to. We're just so different. But in terms of being when I actually when I got there, I was one of four black people. Hmm. So I did have that benefit. But I had a very supportive program, a very supportive program director who was a woman. The APD was a woman. There are lots of women attendings. So I had a lot of support. So the transition wasn't that bad for me at all. What were some of the struggles that you dealt with in residency? So in radiology residency, it's the struggles that I had were just being confident you know, being confident in my abilities and my knowledge, uh, you are really thrown in there. So radiology residency is not physically demanding for the most part, but it is extremely mentally demanding. And at US or LAC USC, they just throw you in there. On day one, I remember this and I will (laughs) forever remember this. (laughs) I was on the GIGU rotation, first day of radiology residency. And they're like, okay, so, yeah, just read a few studies. And when you get some, this is the attending. When you get some, just come find me and then we'll read out. I don't know how to dictate. I don't know Mm. what I'm supposed to say. I don't know, like, how to look at an abdominal x-ray. I don't know how to do fluoro. And so it it, it probably took me, like, an hour to read one abdominal x-ray, which should take like a minute, you know, it takes me like less than a minute now. But I just remember that so vividly, like, oh, so y'all really aren't going to give me any instruction, huh? (laughs) On top of that, that, you're answering phone calls. So you're fielding phone calls from other residents and fellows and attendings and people who have been there for years and they know what they're doing and asking for. And you're just like, I I don't know. Can you look at this x-ray for me real quick? And you're like, you, you're fielding (laughs) phone calls. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So that's part of radiology residency. You answer phones. Oh, <laughs> There's no. no secretary at LAC USC. You are the secretary. But I think it's helpful in the long run. But yeah, yeah very, 
very different experience, um, lots of hands-on experience. And radiology residency is really learning by doing. So it was very hard for me because I'm a little bit of a perfectionist. I want to do things right and I don't want to hurt anybody. And so this do by learning or learn by doing, that was hard for me because I didn't want to make any mistakes. You know, it would terrify me to have to do CT guided biopsies or do ultrasound guided biopsies because I'm like, I don't really know how to hold this ultrasound probe or, you know, I don't know the best way of how to do this and that. So um, that was probably the hardest part of residency for me. And then the second hardest part is when they make you work overnight. So every radiology, not maybe, most radiology residencies, you have to do some overnight work, Mm -hmm. whether you're covering the ER or whether you're on call. Um, And you are, so there was one resident covering LA County Hospital, which is a very large level one trauma center in LA. And you have one little resident covering the ER, the inpatients, and the private hospital tech. So that is very daunting, yes. And so (laughs) you can imagine on a busy trauma night when traumas are rolling in back to back to back, you have this one trainee who's in there like fielding the traumas, fielding the phone calls, because again, you answer the phones too, and then fielding pages from the other hospital and inpatient, you know, all for radiology. So that was very hard. You have to learn quickly how to um, prioritize what needs to be read now, what can be read in a few minutes. Um, so I, those are the two hardest parts for residency for me. Jeez. Yeah, that's a little overwhelming. So tell me, tell me uh, how, how do you feel about the field trips? Because I remember when I was an intern or in the ICU, we would all traipse down to the radiology reading room and find you guys hiding out in the dark and then go over a scan. <laughs> How does that make you feel? As a resident, I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> I, was like, I hated it because I envied the time that you guys had. Like, oh, in no. my mind, you guys actually had time to all stop and come down here and huddle behind me <laughs> to look at five or six different studies. <laughs> like, <laughs> I was like, what, do you guys not have patience to see what's happening? But it's very intimidating that when you're in training, at least in your early years, it's very intimidating because you feel like everyone else knows so much more than you because each specialty uses imaging. Every single specialty in that hospital, even pathology, they all use imaging. And they get very good at looking at that one study. So a GI doctor might be very good at reading or looking at an MRCP. You know, a neurosurgeon is going to be very good at looking at an MRI brain or spine, depending on their specialty. Mm -hmm. And so in the early years, you really feel like they have a better handle on it than you. And so when you guys come on down to radiology (laughs) and you're asking these very specific questions, we're like, um you know, I, maybe this is it. But once you get into your later years, you get a little bit more confidence. You're like, you know, it's much easier to navigate those field trips. And I started to appreciate it because then I can get to know the ordering. You know, I just see a name for who ordered it, but now I could put a face with the name and now I can have an actual conversation with you. And now I can ask you, so what are you guys really looking for when you order this study? <laughs> or, you know, what's most important to you? Like, what do you really want to know? And so it just creates that relationship where if I'm kind of struggling trying to figure out what's going on with the patient, I can be like, you know, text you or call you, hey, you know, what's really going on? Help me out. Or do you think this is important? I'm seeing this thing on this study. Is this important to you? Like, should I mention this? So. It, it was a little bit of a growing experience, but at first I hated it, and then I came to love it because then I get to know people. It, yeah, <laughs> you know, I know everybody's like radiologists don't <laughs> like people, but I like people. I like to talk to people, so yeah, I came to enjoy it eventually. Radiology is you do one year of internship, medicine or surgery, or a transitional year, which those are fading out. Then you do four years of radiology training. Then you do 
one year of fellowship. And this is where it's different from other specialties. Our fellowship is not really optional. There hmm. are like 95% of radiology residents do a fellowship. It's the <clears throat> minority of residents who do not go on to do a fellowship. So you do a one or two year subspecialty fellowship. I chose neuroradiology. And then you go out into practice. And the weird thing is that when you go out into practice, you revert back and do everything. So huh. <laughs> even though I'm neuro trained, I'm reading everything, MSK, ultrasound, P, all of it. So leads to my last question. This is the one that I'm sure everybody has for radiology. Is it with and with and without with or like, I'm not going to lie. I click all three with without <laughs> contrast. How does that work? It depends on what you're looking for. It really depends. That will determine whether you want the study with contrast, with or without, or with and without contrast, or just without <laughs> contrast. It really just depends. So if y'all ever have that question, please just call your radiologist. We will be happy to guide you and tell you whether you need contrast or you don't. We're always happy because the question comes to us anyway. If it's ordered incorrectly, the text comes to us and say, do you need contrast, do you not? And sometimes we end up having to call you guys anyway and figure out what you're really looking for so that we can know whether we need to give the patient contrast or not. So if there's a question, just ask. All right, I'll take it. You know, if I always love to talk about radiology. I love it, I absolutely love it. It was a very long experience, but I think it's a unique one. and. I hope more black students go into it. We need us. Absolutely. I, I'm sure you're going to motivate and uh, get a couple more people interested just by what you've shared. A couple? <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Branscombe, thank you so much for, for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. The Black Doctors Podcast is a nonprofit volunteer passion project with the goal of inspiring all who listen. Tune in next week for another episode of the Black Doctors Podcast with Dr. Stephen Bradley, 